Hallelujah. Let's, let's pray today. Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your mercy and for your grace. Thank you for who you are, what you have promised. I thank you for the things that you have promised that you want to make new and fresh to our hearts, that you want to reveal in our lives, that you want us to begin to hang on to your truth, and in doing so, we're hanging on to you, that we let go of the other things that we're hanging on to and really begin to cling to you, Lord Jesus. Lord, thank you for your presence here. Thank you for this time where we can worship you in spirit and in truth. I pray that you'd help us this morning not to go through motions, Lord, and not just to do it because it's a Sunday morning, but for, for there to be an exchange that happens in our hearts, Lord, as we give you our love, that we receive you and what you want for us today. Holy Spirit, lead us. Holy Spirit, we depend on you. Holy Spirit, have your way in us today. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said. Amen. Amen. Let's clap to the Lord again. He's worthy. You're worthy, God. Thank you, God.
Amen. The battle is the Lord's. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. I just feel like it's so freeing to know that it's not up to me. It's we just need to surrender to the Lord and say, Father, it's in your hands. So whatever you're facing today, just surrender that to the Lord and stand in the joy that you can have in spite of your struggles, in spite of the situation that you are in today. Know that you can have joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And we are given the Heavenly Father and through His Son, Jesus, that we can lean on. Amen. We are going to learn a new song together today about joy. There's joy in the house of the Lord. And this song reminded me of the first, probably one of the first verses I ever learned in Sunday school. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. So we're going to sing the chorus together. And then we'll start from the top so that when we get to the chorus, you guys are already going to know this part. It goes, there's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Let's try it one more time. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Of the Lord. 
Then God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your name. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your name. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your name. Thank you for the joy that is found in you. And Lord, we just take this time together to look to you, to raise our voices before you, and to honor you, to bless your name, Lord God. You are so worthy of praise, Father. We focus in on you today. Lord, I just pray that we would put aside any distraction, Lord. And that we would look into the eyes of our Heavenly Father today. Lord, we come here to bless you. Not to serve ourselves. Not to be entertained. We come here to honor you. And to tell you of your worth, Lord God. Bless your name. We bless your name, God. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship.
worship your holy name. I'll worship your holy name. We worship you, Lord. Above. Jesus. Lord, thank you for the way that you love us. Father, thank you for the way that you've demonstrated that, that love by sending your son to the cross for us. And Jesus, you're not just going out of obedience, but willingly because you wanted to show us your great love. Lord, I pray that your love would grow within us today and that in turn we'd be able to share our love with you. Jesus, you said that whoever loves you would obey your commands. Lord, I pray that our hearts would fall in love with your word, fall in love with what you say, because what you say is the very best. It's the best for us. Lord, we thank you today. We receive you. We receive your love. We receive your word. Let it sink into our hearts, be embedded in our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. so good to be together today. Uh, oh, I just, I just, I love feeling the Lord's presence together. It's special to be able to worship and encounter him, but it's extra special to be able to do that together. So if you're visiting with us for the first time, welcome to our local open Bible family that's just one part of the great big family of God. We want you to sense God's love today and uh, receive his word. Just before we get into the word this morning, uh, I want to share a video with you. As I mentioned before, this last week was family camp, and we had a great time out at family camp, a time of learning about ha how to have Christ-centered homes. And so if you weren't with us, we missed you. But here's a little advertise advertisement maybe to whet your appetite to be a part of family camp next year. Let's take a look. What can
see that wild man there at the end? He about took out the cameraman. That was me, right? So I wanted to show you that, uh, hopefully to, to encourage you to get involved next time around, uh, but then also to be able to say thank you to everybody who worked um, behind the scenes to help make sure that family camp happened. It was an awesome time. Um, one of the things that Pastor Bieran shared with me kind of as debriefing afterwards is the, just the value of being able to be together not only to have fun, because I believe that God created us to have relationships where we can be together and have fun, but there's a value of being together and serving together. And in our experience, what it seems like is when we serve together for God, it's like he, he connects our hearts even more with one another. And that's what he was doing at family camp. So hopefully if you weren't able to be involved this time, next time around, we'd love to have you be a part. And in the meantime, we're going to be pursuing Christ-centered homes. Hallelujah. A couple weeks ago, we looked at a scripture in Lamentations, Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. I want to start there this morning. It says this, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Aren't you thankful that God's mercies are new every morning? Yeah? And it doesn't make any difference what time you wake up. Maybe you're one of those people that sleep in. So if you get up at 11.30 a.m., it doesn't mean that you only have 30 minutes of God's mercies left, right? <laughs> it means that whenever you start your day, <clears throat> God has new mercies available to you. God has new things planned that he wants to do. And we need to receive this verse into our hearts because if we don't believe that, how are we going to receive or even begin to participate in the new things that God wants to do in us? His word is true. Amen? Mercy is when we don't get what we do deserve. Jesus took what we deserved. What did we deserve? Well, we deserved shame because of our sin. And we deserved punishment. And we deserved death. But Jesus took all of that on for us. Amen? Romans 5.8 says it like this, but God demonstrates or he shows us exactly how much he loves us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So it wasn't that Christ died when we became aware of his mercy. It wasn't that Christ said, I'm going to pay the price when you finally own up to what you did. No, before we, before we ever admitted that we were sinners, God says, I love you. And whether or not you take me up on this offer, I'm going to allow your sin to be put on my son, the penalty for your sin, that I might give you mercy. Amen? That's how serious God is about his mercy. He wants us to participate in it. Because God loves you, he wants to give you new mercies every day. Not just that he did love you, but he loves you today, right now. He has new mercies for each one of us right now. So we've talked about participating in God's mercies. Okay? There's a few ways that we can do that. Well, we recognize first that they are there. Okay? And then we say, you know what? Because God's got new mercies, I'm not going to dwell on the past. That's why he says, uh, forget the former things. Stop dwelling on the former things. Look, I'm doing a new thing. And then he tells us that we can participate in new mercies by renewing our minds. That's what I want to talk to you today. I want to talk to you about renewing your mind. All of these things, all of the ways that we participate by recognizing his mercies, by forgetting the past, and by renewing our minds, they all have to do with this thing up here. Okay? What are you going to do with, with this? In order to participate in God's mercies, God wants you to do something with this. This thing needs to be renewed. Okay? If it doesn't get renewed, it, it, here's the thing. When when Jesus comes into your life, when you put your faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, okay, Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So you have this salvation experience. From the minute that you do that, the moment that you do that, God takes, he puts his Holy Spirit inside of you. His Holy Spirit gives new birth to your spirit. But in a sense, your mind stays the same. I'm not saying that God doesn't begin to do some work there, but I'm saying the work that he wants to do requires our participation. That's why this thing needs to be transformed. Your spirit has been transformed. You're alive, but you still live in this body and in this world. And in order for, all, for you to access all that God wants to give you, 
something's got to happen up here. You've got to participate up here. That's what I want to talk to you today about renewing your mind. Romans 12.1 says, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. What's the pattern of this world? Sin and selfishness. That's what it is. But be transformed, be changed, be made new by the renewing of your mind. When that happens, the Bible says, you'll be able to test and prove or understand what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Much of what we do in this life and the way that we experience God is going to be dictated by whether or not we're willing to be obedient and say, Lord, I'm going to have my mind renewed. Amen? God wants us to renew our minds. Uh, please look with me at another promise of God found in James, James chapter 1, and we'll be looking at verses 5 through 8. We've got the words up there on the screen for you. That's great to have your own Bible, take notes, highlight, underline, all that stuff. Why? Because we want to get the words off the page and get them into our hearts and in our minds. James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, I'm going to raise my hand right now, right? If any, that's me. <clears throat> if any of you lacks wisdom, wisdom isn't Wisdom is, is unlike knowledge. It, 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 knowledge is a part of wisdom, but wisdom is not just knowledge. You can have somebody that's really smart, really intellectual, but they don't know how to apply that, okay? And so they're not very wise. They may be very intelligent, but not very wise. Wisdom, there, it, it, it includes knowledge, but there's also an aspect of understanding and application. If any of you lacks wisdom... You should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not to expect, expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is a double-minded and unstable in all that they do. Here's the thing. I used to not quite understand this, and so I kind of got this a little wrong, but I used to think that if I had doubt, that my doubt would disqualify me from God giving me wisdom, okay? Uh, but that's really not the correct interpretation of the Scripture. Here's what happens, though. God wants to give you his wisdom just like he wants to give you his mercy. And if you have a doubt in your mind... It's not that God's going to say, well, I'd give it to you, but you're still doubting. Eh, thanks for playing. Okay, Try again. No, what happens is God, I believe, releases that. But what happens is when we have doubt in our mind, what happens is it keeps us from accessing the wisdom that is already available to us. There are things that God has already given that he wants us to tap into. There are new things, like new mercies every day that he wants to give us, but he wants us to begin to access both. Doubt will get in the way, not of him giving it. Doubt will get in the way of us receiving it, okay? Which is why it's important that we get this thing renewed and we become convinced, more convinced than our feelings, because your feelings will convince you you don't deserve it. Well, thank goodness his mercy is not based on whether or not you deserve it. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But it's based on his word, right? We might think, well, I'm going to be disqualified. Because, uh, he's not going to give me wisdom. Do you know what I did the other day? He's not going to give me wisdom. But he says here, if you ask me, I'll give you wisdom without finding fault. I'm not going to look at you and say, nah, nah, I don't think so. I don't think you really mean it. If you ask God from your heart, Lord, would you give me wisdom? God will give it to you. This morning, I want to share with you three points about renewing your mind. And the first one is this. I, I worded it a little bit differently, but it, it, these, this all has to do with renewing our mind today. So I want to use the word thought often. Point number one, if you want to have your mind renewed, ask God to give you his thoughts. Ask God to give you his thoughts. When you ask for wisdom, essentially, that's what you're asking for, okay? When you ask for wisdom, you're asking for God to give you his thoughts, for, to give you his understanding, to give you his revelation, so ask God. The Bible says that sometimes we have not because we ask not. So uh, sometimes we ask not because we're depending on our own ability. 
okay? Or maybe we wait till the last moment when it's like we've tried everything else to work out this situation, and now we recognize we can't do it, so we need God's wisdom. Proverbs 9.10 says this, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and that knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Here's what I would propose. Instead of us waiting to where we get into situations that we don't know how to deal with and then asking God for wisdom, God wants us to begin to ask him more regularly, not just for wisdom and understanding to deal in situations. That's not where true wisdom begins. True wisdom begins in understanding who he is. It's in getting a knowledge of the Holy One, and when we get that knowledge of the Holy One, it begins to illuminate our minds. It begins to renew our minds. We begin to take on His thoughts as we ask God. He will do it. Listen, Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also, along with Him, graciously give us all things? Somebody say all things. You might be thinking right now, is God really going to give us all things? Okay. What all thing? What, what's included in the package of all things? Okay. Is there a private island? Is there a Tesla land to water vehicle? Is there quantum slash free Wi Fi? Do all of those things, are they a part of all things. Let me look at another scripture because I want to help you understand what all these things are pertaining to. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. It says, His divine power has given. Somebody say, has given. has given. So here's what I want you to understand. There are some things that you need that God has already given. And it's not a, it's not a matter of God giving them again. God already gave his son. He's not giving them again. He doesn't need to. But doubt will keep you, not, well, it won't keep God from giving, but it will keep you from accessing what he's already given. So there's things he's already given, and there's new things like his mercy that he wants to give every day. His divine power has given us everything that we need for a godly life. Okay, That's what the all things are referring to, all the things that we need for a godly, a godly life. Through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Here's what I want to tell you. All the things that you need in order to live a godly life, God has already given. He's already given his son. When he gave his son, he gave forgiveness. He gave redemption. He gave his spirit. Hallelujah. Jesus gave his spirit. He's given us his word. And on and on and on and on. There's all these things that he's given. What are we doing with them? He says, I want you now to begin to participate. Where am I going to participate? Up here by the renewing of your mind, the first way you can do that is say, God, would you please, please begin to give me your thoughts? I need wisdom. I know wisdom starts with me fearing you, respecting you, honoring you, and understanding you. I want your thoughts. If you ask him, God's not going to say, no, 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 you're not good enough. He says, I will give them to you without finding fault. Amen? So we need to begin to ask. Hallelujah. Notice in this verse, 2 Peter 1, 3, that all we need for a godly life comes through our knowledge of him. Knowledge of him. As we grow in our knowledge of him, we grow in our understanding of him, our revelation of him, then he grows in us, amen, and our experience in him grows as well. The Greek word for knowledge here is epignosis, and it means this, true knowledge. It is correct and precise. It is having a full discernment. God wants us to get a full discernment. He wants us to understand he wants me to understand. Listen, Andy, I've got new mercies for you today. Don't disqualify yourself. You might not feel like you deserve them, but that's just who I am and the way that I operate. And I love you, son. I want you to know that. Okay? Buy into that. God gives us wisdom generously without finding fault, but he says, hey, I can't give you this unless you ask. You, gotta, you need to ask. You need to participate. You need to want it. And if you want it, if you want your mind to be renewed, I will come in and I will help be a part of that process and we will do this thing together. Praise God. We need to ask and believe and receive and discover. Again, ask, point number one, in order to have a renewed mind, number one, ask God for his thoughts. Lord, I need your thoughts. 
I want my thoughts to be like your thoughts. Let's move on to our next scripture, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. The Apostle Paul writes, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, according to this verse, it appears as if there is part of the old us that is still there and has the potential to be corrupted. I know that 1 Corinthians 5.17 says, if anybody is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. What that's talking about is the transformation that happens in you by faith, by grace through faith in your spirit. But what's the old part? What's the old part where it says, listen, there's, there's an old part of you that has to be put off because if it doesn't get put off, not only can you not put the new self on, but it'll start being corrupted. I believe that old part is this. Because in a moment when you put your faith in Jesus, he transforms your spirit. But over time, as you walk with Jesus, he will help you to transform or to renew your mind. Okay. My second point is this. In order to have our minds renewed, we have to put off old thoughts. You say, well, Pastor Andy, you just talked about that last week. I might talk about it again next week. I may talk about it until we start doing it. Because we have to start putting off every single thought that gets in the way of us having a renewed mind. Now, of course, I'm talking about sinful thoughts. What is sin? Disobedience to God. It's anything that violates the character of God or the word of God. Okay? So we have to put that off. But there's other patterns of thinking that we have to put off. Patterns of the past where we'd say, no, I'm not good enough. God doesn't love me enough. You don't know what I've done. I'm disqualifying myself. Didn't his word already say, if you ask me, I'm not going to find fault with you, right? So you got to start believe his word, believing his word more than you believe your feelings. Trust his word. You might want to speak that word out loud. You might want to hang it up in your car. You might want to put it on your bathroom mirror. You might want to do whatever you got to do to get that word inside of you so that when that little pesky voice that comes from, I don't know, your own imagination or the devil himself that says, you're not good enough, God's not going to do anything for you. You know, there's, a, there's an old song that Carmen sang, and he said, you know what, when the devil reminds you of your past, you just remind him of his future. Hallelujah. Because you have a future in Christ. Amen. So put off the past, put off the old thoughts, put on the new thoughts. The next thing that we have to put off are patterns of thinking. Patterns of thinking. Have you ever had some wrong patterns of thinking? It's like you have an argument with somebody else when they're not even around. Like you start to anticipate the next conversation that you're going to have with them. You're like, oh, I'm going to bring this up. This needs to be addressed. And I'm going to say this. And when I say this, they're probably going to say this. And then I'm going to come back. I'm going to get them with this. Right? It's like, why are you even doing this? No one else is here. You're having an argument in your brain. Okay? With an imaginary person. We've got to put that stuff off. Put off the arguments. Put off, put off things like lust. Where, where, where does lust occur? Up here. Right? And that's, that's how... That's what happens when we start to get corrupted. It's not that Jesus hasn't done a work in our spirits. He has. But that corruption begins to happen in our mind, and then we become double-minded between the thing that God's already done in the spirit and what's happening in our mind. The Bible says if you don't put your mind on Christ, you can't follow Christ. If you put your mind on the flesh, if you're lusting after the flesh, you're lusting after money, you're lusting after pleasure, you can't follow Christ. That's what this is all about. Amen? We want to follow him so that he can reveal himself to us. So we put off the past. We put off patterns of thinking. We put off pride. I don't know if you've ever struggled with pride, but maybe in some way, shape, or form, we all do. And, you know, I'm, I, I've, I've struggled with pride. Not to say i got a ton of things to be, you know, prideful about. But I think um, I wanted to share this with you. It's kind of embarrassing, but it's true, so I'll share it. Maybe you can apply it. Um, one of the ways that I have struggled with pride is by making myself <clears throat> the hero of my story. 
So you know what it's like to maybe, you know, kind of fantasize in your mind about being the guy who hits the last shot and wins the state championship or whatever it is that you're going to win. Uh, or by coming to somebody's rescue and being the hero. Sometimes I've been guilty of lifting myself up to be the hero in my mind, and when I lift myself up to be the hero, I have a tendency to begin to look down on others and to think, why aren't you doing things like this? Like, that's really dumb, you know, like, sorry. Uh, that, you know, you, this, is, this is the wrong way, to, and, and we, we start to, when we elevate ourselves, we start to look down on others. And here's what I felt like the Lord showed me. He's like, Andy, you need to stop up here. You need to, be the, you need to stop being the hero of your story. And up here, you need to make me, Jesus, the hero of your story. And begin to elevate me and what I've done for you and the way I love you and what I've supplied you with. Amen? That's a big change, right? But God wants us to participate in the renewing of our minds by making that change, by asking God for his thoughts and by putting off the old thoughts. Can you say amen? Are you ready for another promise? You're like, Pastor Andy, you promised to be done. No, I'm not making that promise. I'm not making it. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. Isaiah 26, 3. Normally the verses that we put up are from the New International Version, and that's just because that's the version that I grew up reading. I think it's a great version. There are other good versions that are out there, the New King James, and uh, New American Standard, the, 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 the ESV. There's, there's, a, there's a bunch of good versions because um, I don't believe that just one version is anointed, although I think there's some versions that are better than others, but I believe that the inerrancy of the Scripture is preserved through the interpretation of the Holy Spirit. And you need to have the Holy Spirit help you to understand the Word of God. So we're going to look at this verse today in the New King James Version, uh, just because I like the way that it's worded. Isaiah 26, 3, it says, You will keep him or her in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he or she trusts in you. Let's read it again. You will keep him or her in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he or she trusts in you. You know what the Hebrew word for peace is? You could say shalom. So in the original text, in the Hebrew text, the way that this is, is, it reads is, uh, it, it says, you will keep in shalom, shalom. It uses the word peace twice. And the, the repetition of the word increases the intensity of the word. And then the translation of it is perfect peace. Listen, God has a perfect, a perfect peace. And that perfect peace is available to us, the Bible says, when our minds are stayed on him. What does it mean to have a mind that is stayed on the Lord? What does that mean? What does that look like? Does that mean that you have to be thinking about the Lord 24-7? Well, I'd like to, I like to think that I think about the Lord quite often, but honestly, there's some times where my brain is so involved in whatever it is that I'm doing that I couldn't tell, to tell you that I'm consciously aware, I'm not meditating on Jesus because I don't want to saw my you know, hand off, or whatever it is that I'm doing, I'm kind of engrossed in that. All right? But... I wanted to understand what it means to have a mind that has stayed on him. What does it look like? Well, in Isaiah 26.3, it uses the word stayed. The, the Hebrew word for stayed is somak. Probably didn't pronounce that the best, but that's my best effort. And it, get, it means to rest or to lean. Okay? To rest or to lean. Now, this is my second service. Okay, but I'm not a wimp, so it's not that easy. It's not that hard for me to stand up here. But if I were tired, okay, I could maybe act like I'm really intense and lean over the pulpit, all right, and get a little break, a little relief, because I'm not using all of my strength to support myself. Uh, I'm actually using the podium. Or maybe you've been on your feet for a long time and you work a long day, and if you're going to rest, you might lean up against something, take a little weight off, right? Or if you're really, really tired, Okay, you've probably heard the phrase, sit down, stay a while, 
All right? So just uh, take, it, take it easy, unload. So now I'm just going to unload, and I'm just going to sit back, and I'm going to relax, and I'm going to recline, and I am just going to lean on this fully. I'm being fully supported. Right, I might just finish the rest of the service right here, if you don't mind. Okay. That's what it means to have a mind that stayed on him. It's not a mind that's leaning on something else. I can't lean on this stage and that chair at the same time. I can't do it. And God says, you can't lean on the things of the world and lean on me at the same time. When you have your mind stayed on me, it means you're leaning on me, you're supported by me, and I'm upholding you. Oftentimes, we lean mentally, we're stayed mentally on the things of this world that would support us. Okay? We, we, what's going to support us? Well, you know what? I'm a, my job's going to support me, and my savings is going to support me, and my 401k is going to support me, and if I lose, I, I, I've got this plan, and this is, or we're supported by, uh, when's the next time I get to vaca- take a vacation? Okay? Or you're supported by, when's the next family? When's the next? God says, I don't want your mind to be stayed there and leaning on that, because when you lean on something that is unstable, you only set yourself up for a fall. Doesn't he say, don't be a double-minded man. Don't be unstable in all your ways. I want you to have a renewed mind. I want you to ask for my thoughts. I want you to put off the old thoughts, and then I want to help you have your mind stay on me. Keep leaning on me. If you discover that your mind's been away from me and it's been on something else, then get your mind back to me and get to leaning and thinking about Jesus. And the more we do that, the more the transformation occurs, the more he reveals himself, the more we come into unity with who he is and what he's doing. Be transformed. When your mind is stayed on him, it'll result in peace. You see, when you start to live, when you have your mind set on Jesus, here's what's going to happen. The benefits, you're going to recognize there's new mercy. Amen? When you have your mind that stayed on Jesus, he's going to give you discernment and say, that's an old thought. That's the part of the old self. Get rid of that. I got the new self coming in, baby. It looks real good. Put it on right now, right? I want you to let your mind be stayed on me, rest on me, be supported by me. Don't be supported. Don't have your mind hung up on the things of the world. Hallelujah. Put off those thoughts. Let your mind be renewed on Christ. If you didn't catch it, point number three is this. Lean your thoughts toward God. Lean your thoughts towards God. Think about who he is, what he has done, what he has said, what he has promised. That's why, oh, we emphasize the word so much. It's in the name of our church. Open your Bible center. Well, open Bible center, right? We want you to get God's word inside of you so that your mind is being renewed. In John chapter 14, verse 27, as we get near the closing here, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, guys, my peace I give to you, but I don't give it to you like the world gives it. When the world gives peace, it's based on things that are external. Okay, It's things that, oh, I'm looking forward to this out here, and I'm looking forward to this out here, and all of a sudden we find that we're maybe leaning on something that we shouldn't be leaning on, and our mind is not stayed on him. we got to get our minds back. So I'm going to give you a peace that's not based on things external. I'm going to give you a peace that won't ever leave you because it's based on me and it will dwell inside of you. Amen? He'll keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. When your mind is being renewed, your thoughts are leaning on Jesus, and the result is wisdom and discernment and peace. I don't know about you, but I, man, life sometimes can beat you up, right? The struggle is real but Jesus is greater. And I want to participate in his mercy, in his discernment, in his peace. I want to participate. How am I going to do that? Renewing this mind. Renewing this mind. Lord, give me your thoughts. I put off the old thoughts. I'm going to let my mind keep coming back to you and coming back to you and coming back to you and leaning on you and leaning on you and leaning on you. And I'm going to think about your word and I'm going to pray. I think that's that's how David became a man of God because he was out there watching sheep and he's watching those sheep, but I think he was leaning He was leaning on, remember that old song? He was leaning on the everlasting arm. And the Lord was revealing himself. We're going to receive communion today. If you'd go ahead and grab your cup. What does it mean to commune? 
It means to communicate intimately. Jesus wants to communicate intimately with us. He wants there to be a deep exchange between who he is and who we are. In John chapter 6, verse 53, Jesus was talking not only to his 12 disciples, but he was talking to many of his followers. And he said to them this phrase, which was very hard to, for them to receive and to even understand. He said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. Now, we understand today that the words that Jesus was speaking were spiritual words. Jesus was not endorsing cannibalism. But many of the people who were there had a very hard time understanding what he was saying, and as a result, they left. They got up and they left. It's a little embarrassing. And Jesus turned to his other 12 disciples and he said, would you guys like to leave too? And I love Simon Peter's response in John chapter 6, verse 68. Here's what he said when Jesus asked them, asked them that. He said, would you like to leave too? Simon says, Lord, who else are we going to go to? It's like he was saying, we don't, have, we don't have anybody else to lean on. And we may not fully understand exactly what it is that you're saying, but we've come to trust you. Then he goes on to say, we discover that you have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. That's, that's the goal of having a renewed mind is that you would come to believe and to know intimately the Holy One, that you'd know His thoughts, you'd know His love, you'd know His mercy, you'd know His discernment, that you would know His peace, that He wants you to know Him. That's what this is all about. Would you go ahead and peel back that first layer and take the bread? And he said, unless you eat my flesh... So when we eat something, we consume it, we, 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 we receive it, we take it in. Jesus is saying, if, if you don't receive me, who I am and what I'm going to do for you, you can't have any part of me. Lord, we thank you for this bread. We thank you that it represents your broken body. We thank you that you were willing to go all the way to the cross to make us new in spirit, help us to participate in the renewing of your mind so that you can have your way in us and that your fruit can be produced in our lives, that people would see you in us, that you would be the hero of our story. In Jesus' name, let's take and eat. You can go ahead and peel back that next layer, please. Jesus said, unless you drink my blood, you'll have no part of me. We recognize today that this cup represents the shed blood of Jesus poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus said to his disciples, as often as we eat the bread and we drink the cup, we need to do it remembering him, who he is, what he's done, and looking forward to him coming again. Jesus is coming again. May our hearts be ready. May our minds be ready. May our minds be washed. May they be renewed so that we can not only believe but know him intimately. In Jesus' name, let's take and drink. Please let me pray a prayer of blessing over you today. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for its truth. We pray, Lord God, that you would help us now begin to participate in the renewing of our minds, that we would be asking for your thoughts, Lord, that we'd be taking captive every thought that's not of you, that we'd be kicking out the old and inviting in the new, that in our minds we would keep leaning and leaning and leaning on you, the knowledge of you, that we might be supported by you, that we might be transformed, that we might be changed, that we might not only believe but experience and come to know all that you are. Lord, we thank you today for the way that you want to be intimate with us. May your light shine through our lives that others would come to know as well. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. May God bless you this week as you take steps to renew your mind. Remember these points. If you need prayer this morning, please come up. Our elders will be up here to pray with you. Don't forget to sign up for hockey camp. God bless you. I love you. I'm praying for you. Have a great week.